I had a screening of three works of mine from 2010 and 2012. Uh, Jewel, uh, which is a piece that is equally um, a piece of music as much as it's a film. And uh, Jewel is a sort of uh, uh, a journey from the depth of the fossilized past. So it starts with a deep sea fish and it transforms into the present and into a moment where two people are dancing to the music that is almost coming out of this fish. So it's hard to explain what this work is without seeing it. And Muslim Goes R.I.P. is a film that happens in an apartment in Manchester in 1982. Uh, it happens around a little boy who is maybe bored. There are no words in this film, but there are sounds of him touching things in this room. And it was made, the film was made as a sort of, or its starting point was an homage, in a way, to the figure of Muslim Goz, who's a musician who in 1982 took this name in Manchester in response to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Uh, we never see Muslim Goz, there's none of his music, there's nothing in the film that refers to him except the title and the fact that it happens in that place at that time. Blind Ambition is for me, actually it's quite an important work for me. It's a work that I have a lot of uh, feelings about. And uh, it is, it is uh, formally very calculated in a way. Uh, all the choices that are made have, uh, have, have two sides to them. One is a functional aspect in terms of how to construct this film together. So for example, uh, the way it's edited or the fact that there's are intervals between each scene and the next that happens on public transportation, the fact that this, these intervals are intercut, you know, you enter the, the bus or the subway or the tram or whatever it is, and it intercuts the beginning of the journey with the end of the journey. And so in a way, it sort of collapses this kind of urban time and it sort of like throws the, the, the spectator, the viewer, uh, into like a sort of jumble where, you know, that location, this film is happening in a location which we never see from afar except at the very end of the film when you have this shot of the whole city or like of the cityscape. Uh, that location is being destabilized through these intervals. But at the same time, these intervals are very important functionally because they wipe away the memory of the scene you just saw and allow you to see the next scene in a new fashion. The fact that there is absolutely no sound except the sound of the human voice is an integral element of the meaning of the work itself because the work is about, in some ways, is about language and is about relations and is about this uh, moment where a consciousness comes into being. So I keep imagining that as we watch it, when there is no speaking, it's as if we're watching something that doesn't exist. And the moment the human voice comes in, the world is born in a way, or you know, these people suddenly become become real. So you, they're moving from, from being almost like ghosts or phantasms to actually real figures the moment the human voice is entered. And this is why the dubbing is very important, so that you have this sense of a voice that comes from elsewhere and enters the body and is then projected outward. The out of sync is not, was not uh, completely intentional. It's partially because it was a very difficult process. But I didn't care. I mean, I, in the end, I didn't care that I felt like it was an impression more than an actual that they don't have to be 100% synchronized. Uh, but it was, it was quite difficult because we were shooting in the street and da 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 and so the sound itself was very, very difficult to, to capture in this kind of almost uh, lo-fi epic production form. <laughs> so, uh, so there was a bit of difficulty with the dubbing in terms of getting it. But then at one point I decided that it's okay. I can live with a little bit of, you know, it, sometimes it's perfectly synced, sometimes slightly off, and that's fine. It doesn't, for me, it doesn't disturb the work. Maybe in some ways it even emphasizes this feeling of the voice that comes from elsewhere and animates the body. Uh, it's in black and white. That's also particular. Uh, I think that was important because uh, it happens in public urban spaces that are very busy, visually very busy, very colorful, very full of information. And already the film is very dense. It's already very hysterical and hectic and full of, you know, energy and difficulty for the, for the audience to absorb, a lot of things to absorb. 
uh, and I thought it was good to cancel something to make it to allow us to give space to the audience to engage with the work. Um, the process is for me is something very important, but it's really it is very wide because the works are very diverse also in their form and medium and approach. So how, so the process itself to reaching these works is also very diverse. Some works are very immediate, so sometimes something, an observation triggers something and then it's sort of you imagine a whole work and then you kind of discover that work. Sometimes the, the starting point is a title, so you know a word or a sentence comes into mind and you imagine a work with that title and you know nothing else about the work and from the title you, <laughs> you get to the work, so it's sort of the opposite of the usual kind of idea of making a work and giving it a title. It's a title searching for a work. Uh, sometimes it is, uh, it, there are ideas that have been you know, in your mind for years and years and sometimes I find think, notes in my notebook from 20 years ago that relate to something I'm doing now. So I don't know my process exactly what's going on. There is no set system. Uh, I can say that there's a lot of scribbling, you know. Yes, I do have notebooks and I scribble in them and write sometimes a word or something or, you know, draw something and throw it away. This happens a lot and I think it's, it doesn't necessarily lead to the work, but it's a way of like throwing stuff away to get to somewhere. I consider myself as an artist and a musician and also a writer, but we can speak about music and art. And I, I think of these two as separate, completely separate things. So that's why, you know, in my bio I say I'm an artist and a musician. And I don't think of myself as an artist who makes music or a musician who makes art, but rather this and this entity. So on one level, I separate them. I believe in the specificity of this form and this form, and I practice. And my relationship to my material is different. So when I'm making an artwork, even if it involves music, my relationship to this music in the artwork is very different than my relationship to music when I'm performing a concert. So uh, when I'm performing a concert, my expectations and the way I'm treating the material and what I think I can do with it is, has a, the horizon of it is, is, is not the same. It's not, about, it's not about constructing the work, for example. It's about, maybe it's about impact. It's also about the intuitive moment and the live situation. It's about, you know, all of the, or playing with other musicians, for example, or even composing a soundtrack. The, the, the calculations are different. Uh, however, over the years, of course, they have definitely, the things I've learned in music have had a huge impact on things I do in art. And the things I've learned in art has had huge impact on the things I do in music. So, for example, uh, when I, I compose music, I don't compose music by writing a score. I've almost never done it this way. Every time I, I compose a piece, I find a new method to, to compose it with. And uh, this could involve, you know, it depends on what the piece is, but it, it involves, uh, sometimes it involves just, you know, programming something and then finding a way to transcribe it, but sometimes it involves creating scores from scratch, or sometimes it involves working with musicians in the studio and kind of working with them almost in a conceptual way so that I give them something that they perform and then I ask them to change it and I'm almost using the musician to, and asking them to play these things in loops live and then as they're playing I, I actually ask, ask them to change certain notes to go up to go down to you know so I kind of almost sculpt their musical performance and as if they're you know as if it's a form of live composition and as if it's a form of directing almost it's like as if I'm working with a musician as if I'm a as if I'm a director in this sense. Uh, and then in the, same, in the same way in art, there's a lot of works of mine. They don't have music even, but if you look at the structure, you'll find that there is a compositional structure to it that has come, and it's not by choice, it really has come with the fact that you experience this and experience that. So there is, on one level, a very deep connection between the two formats, but on another level, I really also insist on keeping them separate and treating them as separate entities that live on their own.